um, pluralism, monism, and Hasek Chang on realism for realistic people. Over to you. Yes. Thank you, Katie. Not Karen, Katie. <laughs> so, uh, this is my title. Uh, I even have an outline, a structure of the talk, which you may not expect from a German professor. So, uh, <laughs> two main pillars of the book first, uh, then I speak about correspondence, then about pra pragmatist truth, and then I suddenly change the topic, I speak about money. That's very interesting, my monistic religion and all of that. And then I speak about metaphilosophical pluralism, and in the end I will have some sort of conclusion. So let's start first with, I think, something uncontroversial, two main pillars of the book. The first pillar is Hassock defends a form of pragmatism. That seems to be pretty clear, so if you look at the subtitle of the book, A New Pragmatist Philosophy of Science, so you know what to expect. And then we have section titles like Pragmatist Notions of Knowledge, Truth and Reality, Rehabilitating the Pragmatist, and so on. So there are many signs that this is really a piece of pragmatist philosophy, you know, a party line, so to speak, a new one. Um, it's just pragmatist philosophy. And his pragmatist ambition even covers logic, which is interesting. It would have been a, the ultimate price for a pragmatist to argue successfully that even logic was only pragmatically justified, you know, logic about thinking and about action, and then the pragmatist would be extremely happy when he says, yeah, we even got a pragmatist approach there, and you can understand logic only in pragmatist terms, otherwise you don't understand, so it would be great victory. Right? So these uh, positions are always connected with victories and defeats, and that logic is the ultimate, you know, that's the stone, which is the ultimate test, the lackness test, for the viability of pragmatism. Okay, first pillar. Then the second pillar is Hasek defense pluralism in many forms. Also, I think, uncontroversial, conceptual, epistemic, ontological, concerning progress and truth. He defends many forms of pluralism, or concerning pluralism, concerning many subjects. Pluralism is a key aspect of the whole outlook on knowledge that I've advocated in this book. Also, very clear sentence, very clear what he's trying to do. And to, to just a side remark for this reason and his explicitly humanist stance. I've always seen Hasek as uh, the legitimate successor of Paul Feyer, not institutionally, but intellectually. And I think that's right. Now, uh, this is just a remark, and I hope that the number of misunderstandings that I'm committing is small, but I have no guarantee, and we'll see that in, in an hour, so I will know more about that. <laughs> All right, so I start with correspondence. So, correspondence is an important topic in the book, especially uh, the critique of correspondence realism, uh, in chapter 2, and uh, this critique strategically prepares, if I read it correctly, the ground for Hasek's defense of pragmatism. It's just you've got, you've got to get rid of this uh, correspondence ideas, um, and, and then the door is open uh, to replace that by something else, which is pragmatism. And I must straightforwardly uh, say that I agree fully with Hasek that correspondence realism is untenable. And largely for the reason that he invokes. This is, seems to be pretty clear. We don't have to discuss that. And that holds especially for his criticism of the standard correspondence theory of truth. So I fully agree here. However, my therapy of that disease, because the correspondence theory, I think, is really a philosophical disease. I give you arguments for that. Um, it's really a disease, but my therapy is radically different from his. Really very different. Okay, so... The standard view, and you've got to know that, perhaps you don't know enough about the continental tradition if you were brought up in the Anglo-Saxon, um, how shall I put that, domain, right? The standard view in analytic philosophy of the correspondence theory uh, of truth is this. Truth, uh, CT, truth consists in a correspondence between statements, proposition theory, with mind-independent facts or reality. And this is the absolute standard, even Kuhn also believed it, made the same mistakes as Hassock, or different mistakes, because they start all from that, okay? They start, they take that for granted. This is what truth means in the correspondent sense. And um, then the criticism is, of course, the idea is indeed non-operational, because we have no access to mind-independent facts. We have, by the way, a mirror of that discussion also in the discussion about objectivity, that in objectivity, if you define it similar to that, say, ah, but we don't have access, so objectivity doesn't exist. All right, which is bad, right? Sure, so truth doesn't exist uh, for us. Okay, so however, I think the real philosophical weakness of CT is that it merges two very heterogeneous elements 
into one what is called the, the definition of truth, or a theory of truth. These are just, well, I would say it's an explication of truth, right? It, it explains and possibly modifies our understanding of truth. That, that is the case here, two very heterogeneous elements. One is the correspondence idea. The correspondence idea meaning there is a relation between two things, namely thought and things or whatever. So that's the correspondence idea, that's one uh, element. And the other one is metaphysical realism, right? That is presupposed in that definition. So metaphysical realism is a specific assumption about one of the relata. And it's logically completely independent of the correspondence idea. So it's two heterogeneous things. The relation, the relation idea of correspondence, put together with metaphysical realism, and that is supposed to be an adequate theory of truth. Uh, by the way, compare the context of discovery and context of justification, exactly the same thing, five different distinctions merged into one, and then, then people are surprised why they can't talk about it really properly and understand each other. Same thing here, we have two heterogeneous elements merged into one thing without the conscious or reflective um, a company uh, meant uh, by, by philosophers. And I think this is a highly artificial philosophical construction and it does not correspond with our pre-philosophical use of truth, of which it should be an explication. I mean, we talk in everyday life about truth, the philosophical then definition or theory or whatever explication, that should be an explication of what we're doing in our everyday life and it makes, uh, may make more precise and blah, blah, blah. And, but it isn't. It is not at all. And I'm showing you that in a moment. Here's my example one. So the Mount Everest is higher than the Matterhorn, right? That is, of course, also amenable to uh, pragmatist treatment very easily. Uh, but the point here is uh, I, I took this example because it looks as if we have really a possibility of, of correspondence and mind independence. Uh, I first thought I, I write down the matter on is 4,600 meters, but then it's of course mind dependent in some sense because you have the meters. But if you have that relation of being higher, that seems to be independent. So I mean, here isn't that a mind independent fact? Isn't that wonderful? And doesn't when I state that, isn't the correspondence theory exactly right for that? Well, perhaps uh, truth seems to be well captured by uh, CT. But here's example two. Uh, question, did you cheat on me yesterday? And the answer, no, I didn't. No, I didn't cheat on you yesterday. Let's assume uh, this is true. Then the truth of the answer depends, of course, in the correspondence view, depends on whether she or he cheated or not. The facts, did he cheat? I mean, now the problem is the relevant facts are certainly not mind independent because cheating is culture and evil couple dependent. I mean, you may have forgotten, but uh, concerning sexual matters, there are degrees of intensity. You know, it starts from, some, <laughs> from kissing, and then it used to be called uh, petting, you know, light petting, heavy petting. And then uh, at the end is going all the way, as it was pronounced in my youth. I know that from the literature only, of course. Um, or, I mean, in more technical terms, penetration. So it, it's a, it's, it, and, and the question is, what counts as cheating? And couples and cultures are different. So for someone who's already, you know, looking at the behind of a woman is already, of, a, of another woman, maybe already cheating, kissing, what's allowed. So that, that's very fluid, as we also saw in politics, where that once was very important, and the older ones, if you still remember, Monica Lewinsky, and there was a president of the United States, Bill Clinton, and they had some sort of sexual things going on. It wasn't completely clear, and I still remember the picture when Clinton, with his very honest face, looks into the camera and said, I did not have sex with that lady. You know, and probably it was only that denying woman. penetration. That woman, that woman. Yeah. yes, I'm sorry, you're right, you're right. <laughs> so he was probably only denying penetration, but I mean, the other practices were quite funny in a sense. Anyway, so it, it's clear that the relevant facts are not mind independent because cheating, and even cheating maybe even in, in specific couples, you know, you may have agreements what's allowed, what's not allowed, uh, so people have a variety of possibilities here. And here, of course, Hassel's distinction between mind control and mind framing is extremely useful. This is really a, a very, very, very good part of this book, I mean, among other parts as well. Uh, whether cheating took place is mind framed, but not mind controlled. It just depends, you know, did the two go to bed or didn't they, right? This seems to be the fact, but, you know, then to describe that as cheating is something else, because uh, there are these mind 
uh, framing uh, comes into, uh, into play. Thus, in ordinary discourse, the idea of a correspondence between propositions and mind-framed facts is unproblematic and has a good reason to that, and it matters, right? That holds not only for couples, but also for courts, politics, the economy, etc., etc. Whenever we are in the social domain, all the facts that are relevant for some truth claims are mind-framed. It's very obvious in these examples. Um, and um, I fail to see that this cons constitutive element of truth corresponded should or can be given up in these cases. It seems to me, and I'm going to argue for that, uh, it seems to me very clear. But it's not, this mind framing of the relevant facts is not captured by the analytic and analytic philosophy correspondence theory of truth because it speaks about mind independent fact. That's an absolutely crazy, really, I can't believe it that my whole discipline is really believing that shit. I mean, it's, it's so stupid to speak about that absolute uh, independence of the fact. It isn't just look at very few examples like the social example. So, every correspondence can be used in, every, in the everyday world that contains mind-framed objects. For instance, also colors. You can say, yes, Paul is wearing a gray sweater today and blue trousers. And, and you can say that's true or not true. This is, of course, mind-framed colors are secondary qualities. Of course, we can talk about them and, and make truth claims. Truth as correspondence can also be used in an investigation of physical optics where colors do not exist, only spectral, uh, spectral distribution, reflective surfaces, something. So this is a different discourse, but you can use correspondence once you know what you're talking about and what you admit as facts, right? And in that discourse, colors are not admitted as facts, only a wavelength. And you can go further. Also, a Kantian can use truth as correspondence in a world in which things are mind-framed by the forms of intuition and the categories. Of course, you can use truth there. You are not bound to use metaphysical realism together with the um, correspondence idea. But also, metaphysical realists can use truth as correspondence with a mind-independent world. He's, he's free to do so, or even more general now. A properly understood correspondence theory of truth is metaphysically absolutely neutral, right? Because it is liberated from the forced and very unhappy marriage with metaphysical realism. It's just not necessary. Liberate the uh, correspondence idea, and then you can use whatever ontology you want. Truth as correspondence can be coupled with any sort of ontology. You can speak about physical things, Kantian appearances, Kuhnian paradigm shaped world. I mean, Kuhn fell also prey to this idiotic definition of the correspondence theory because therefore he avoided truth. In structure, because he thought, oh, I'm buying the metaphysical realism with the correspondence idea, and then instead he speaks about fits of theory with facts. Well, it's just another word, it doesn't solve the problem. But you solve the problem as soon as you see correspondence is independent of uh, metaphysical realism. So, but we go further, I mean, you have these funny ontologies like tropes or processes, a process ontology, of course, can be wonderfully coupled with correspondence, Wittgensteinian facts of early Wittgenstein, or platonic ideas. You can speak about platonic ideas and make true statements in the reference of platonic ideas, right? Or Harry Potter's <laughs> universe. You may say, oh, yes, Harry Potter studied magic at XYZ college. That's true or false. Everyone knows, yeah, you've got to look it up, and, and then it, it turns out, yes, he did not study in uh, Cambridge, uh, for instance. He studied somewhere else. And of course, you can speak about this universe or Sherlock Holmes' universe. So you find immediately there's absolutely no problem also to, to apply it in literary context. The correspondence idea is always the same. What changes are the, the universe of discourse or the ontology that you are presupposing. And again, the choice of an ontology is completely independent of the correspondence idea. And that re removes all these problems that uh, uh, derive from this uh, idiotic and dogmatic marriage of correspondence with metaphysical realism. By the way, in Aristotle's times, that was different because that was the only thing available at that time. But since the, since the 17th century, we have a, a whole pot, lots of possibilities. Uh, and what was good for Aristotle was good for us. All right. So, truth as correspondence when divorced from metaphysical realism is fully operational, meaning applicable in many, many, many different contexts, scientific, everyday. It's, so it's completely unproblematic. 
Um, and we are by no means to force to give up the correspondence notion of truth, and thus we are not in urgent need of a pragmatist alternative. So it's wonderful, I mean, it seems to work, I don't see a problem uh, with that uh, theory, and we not necessarily need a pragmatist uh, alternative. Still, now trying to do justice uh, to Hazard's book, a pragmatist notion of truth may be superior to a correspondence notion saying this one works, oh, someone comes and says, no, 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 we should have this or uh, that correspondence notion, fine, and it perhaps is superior to a correspondence notion, perhaps globally, perhaps only for certain domains, but that means we must discuss it, investigate it, and look, you know, what's, what's the advantages uh, of this pragmatist notion of truth in, uh, in uh, uh, comparison to correspondence. <clears throat> so let's go to pragmatist uh, theory of truth. Here he says, I subscribe to pluralism concerning truth, there are many different notions of truth which have different uses in various domain and domains and contexts. So he seems to be completely open-minded here and open to all the possibilities. So perhaps correspondence can have a role here as well. Well, it does, I told you already. But I do want to propose that truth by operational coherence is what constitutes primary truth in empirical domains. And what is important here is now primary truth in empirical domains, including science and much of daily life uh, as well. So that's the claim. Apart from the openness, one is the primus inter pares, right? And this is pragmatist theory of truth. Uh, all right. So a note, uh, uh, he, he mentions it, but sometimes people are not so clear. It constitutes, not indicates. So it's really a theory of truth and not a theory about truth indicators or criteria, as it's called, or symptoms or whatever. So this is very important to, because that, that is much stronger. The ambition is much stronger when you say, you've got to change your idea of what truth is. And I, as a pragmatist, I'm the, therapeut, uh, the, the ther therapist for you. And, and uh, you've got to change your thinking, my dear, because it doesn't work with that correspondence stuff. So it constitutes truth. So I am proposing that we ought to mean by truth in order to render it as a useful concept. So in a sense, I mean, the pragmatist uh, belongs to the police. You know, thinking police said, hey, you must not think that way. You know, that's a bad way. And I tell you what you ought to mean by truth. And you've got to change, you know. You, you just have to change. I, I tell you, with arguments, okay, not with weapons, so far. <laughs> okay, so the background motive is, of course, the rejection of the correspondence theory for primary, that is non-derived, empirical truth. That's the main motive that I could fine in the book, you know, and that, that would make, of course, a wonderful motive if you see, well, we do not have a working theory of truth, then someone must come up with, some, with an alternative, and then you say, you know, I'll do that in the pragmatist way, and let's see how far it gets. Okay. Now, instead, and this is now uh, Hasek's uh, from famous uh, page 167, a proposition is true to the extent that there are operationally coherent <coughs> activities that can be performed by relying on it. Okay? And um, I'm not going into details. I think the direction in this one, so true, it follows this one is unproblematic, but I'm not so sure about the other direction. I'm absolutely not so sure. Because if you have uh, operationally career activities that can be performed by, uh, that can be performed, where are the propositions that are then true? I don't know. Anyway, but I'm not going into that. Some other people can do that. So here are my objections. Now. I've got four objections to this pragmatist truth. The main motive, main, I'm not absolutely sure and it's not absolutely essential, but the main motive for pragmatist truth seems to be the inapplicability of uh, the, the correspondence theory. And that, of course, that motive dissolves one correspondence uh, is divorced from metaphysical realism and you have a, 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 a operative um, idea of truth with uh, correspondence. So, um, uh, correspondence becomes smoothly applicable in diverse contexts as it should be, and I, I still, well, perhaps I'm so old that I'm too conservative now to think something else. Uh, I think it's fine. Anyway, second example. Now, and now I sh try to show you that I'm not completely convinced to say it very nicely and friendly uh, about the uh, pragmatist theory. Suppose your partner truthfully tells you, I cheated on you yesterday. And the truth must then be, you know, cashed out in, pragmatic, uh, in pragmatist terms. So, and then what are the truth constitutes operationally coherent activities that can be performed by relying on it? 
So your partner tells you, I cheated on you yesterday, and then the, the truth of that statement must be somehow reflected in certain actions or patterns of actions uh, systematically performable. So for instance, leaving him or her would be one possibility. Many would say, oh, I leave you. Yeah. What if you are unable to accomplish that? Does that mean if you are unable, he didn't cheat on you? Oh, oh. Uh, so hey, what are we doing here? I don't know. Okay, there are alternatives. Forgiving him or her. I mean, if you have a wife, that, yeah, yeah, you know, that may happen. You know, you cheat on me. What if you are unable to, to accomplish that? I mean, uh, and here's probably the next one is the most uh, popular one, I guess. Uh, treating him or her like shit for months in order to make him or her feel miserable and guilty. Right? That may work wonderfully, right? Successful performance. Uh, the problem is, imagine that later your partner, who may be a real lousy guy or woman, tells you, that was only a test, it was a joke. Right? I did not cheat on you, I just tried to test you, how would you react? That's, I'm sorry, that's new in comparison to this <laughs> sentence here. Does any one of this depend on the truth of the statement? Right? Imagine that, that first, um, you know, one person says this and that, and then, then three months later she said, you know, I didn't really see to that guy, he you know, was, was only joking. Yeah, does that anything of the, the you know, success conditions for these behaviors? I don't know, I don't see it. Isn't the correspondence idea much more plausible to capture the truth of the cheating statement? Yes. Was it a fact that they had sex or was it not a fact? I mean, that's so simple. And I mean, in every court, I mean, whenever you convict a murderer, whatever, it's always the same question. Is it a fact or is it not a fact? And then you try to find out whether it's a fact or not. And then you say, yes, he is the murderer. Third point, the disappearance of the difference, which I find is an objection, which uh, uh, has a, uh, con uh, consciously, intentionally does. The disappearance of the difference between successful, intentionally, ontologically false models and successful, approximately true models. And if you now say, hey, wait a minute, approximately true, aren't you a realist? No, in the respective mind frame world, right? And that is what people have, and um, I've studied for the last year's uh, economic models, uh, especially, and that's very important, also in physics, by the way, that you have intentionally false models and intentionally, at least approximately true models in the respective mind frame world. And that disappears, and, and Hazard is aware of that, and I fail to see the advantage of assimilating these two sometimes very different kinds of models by calling intentionally ontologically false models true by operational <coughs> coherence, at least in a limited domain. I don't see the advantage of that. I think it's much simpler to say this is intentionally false but successful, and this is something which tries to capture the real factors that are operative in a situation in a, in a counterfactual model. So I don't see the advantage here, no. On, in the contrary, I think is really false to assimilate these two types of models completely, <clears throat> or well, almost completely, because in a limited domain, maybe you may play around here a little. But I, I don't see, I, I, I have no, no motive to assimilate them because everything I want to say that the model is successful, I can say without that. I can say, yes, you know, we have prediction of that in that domain, and it works there, but I know it's, it's false, and I don't really know, perhaps, it's the compensation of two mistakes, you know, that leads to a successful model. It's completely unrealistic, successful, because of a mistake here and a mistake there. They compensate in a certain domain, so the predictions are wonderful. That happens. It happened in physics many times, so I don't see that, and I see that as a, as a disadvantage of the pragmatist the theory. And finally, I do not find a pragmatist truth convincing, and I do not see a motive to become convinced. So I see that uh, Hasek wants to teach me, Paul, change your idea of truth, right? And I fail to develop a motive for that. You know, I, I, I don't see why should I do that. I'm happy with correspondence. I don't see the problems that he sees because, you know, he falls prey to the marriage of metaphysical realism with correspondence in that tradition of analytic philosophy, which is just very unreflective in this uh, point and in others too, by the way. Anyway, so I, I, I can't do that. I still think that the core meaning of truth in empirical matters, not in mathematics, uh, but in empirical matters, the core meaning is not the pragmatist one, but it consists of correspondent divorced from metaphysical realism. And uh, what we need, in addition to an explication of the meaning or meanings of truth, also criteria or indicators, symptoms, signs, proxies, 
means to improve uh, 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 strength, uh, uh, to improve truth of different strengths. We mean that. And of course, then I say, I offer, uh, open the door to Hassock, but he doesn't want to go through that, that pragmatism offers a very welcome additional criteria. Because that, that is, he's not satisfied with. No, he says, the meaning of truth must be different, and being pushed in the criterion corner is not enough. You know, every idiot sits in the, in the uh, uh, corner there for criteria, but that's not enough, because we want to have really a new meaning of truth, as he says, um, and on some pages. So now I come to monism, and I shall abruptly change my topic, and you will not understand at the moment why I'm doing that. Yes, I'm telling you, so don't think, damn it, I don't get it. Why does he speak about monism now? You don't find it out now, right? Okay, so just a rhetorical little desolate here. Okay, I shall give you some example of monism in order to revive our familiarity with the general phenomenon of monism, right? So I start here, nationality. Uh, I know that I'm in France here. I'm a French, I'm a US citizen. I'm proud to be a French, a US citizen. If I could freely choose, I would choose to be a French or a US citizen. The, well, whether there is one person who really chooses freely what sort of citizen he wants to be, that's Hassel. Uh, but most of us, we just live there. And many of us say, oh, I'm proud to be French, I'm proud to be English. And so, and so it's just one thing. Okay. Faith. I'm a Catholic, a Muslim. I'm proud to be a Catholic, a Muslim. Right? If I could freely choose, I would choose to be a Catholic, a Muslim. That's what people may say, because they are convinced Catholicism is just the best religion. Uh, it's funny how it correlates from where you grew up, but uh, that's a different story. Sport. I'm a fan of PSG. I mean, I'm in France, I know. Or oh, FC Bayern. Okay, I'm proud to be a fan of PSG, uh, FC Bayern. I have freely chosen to be a fan of PSG, of FC Bayern. L -l is the latter plausible when you grew up in Paris or in Munich? Uh, I don't really know. Um, perhaps not necessarily. Now let's go to philosophy. Philosophy very wide. You know, I'm an analytic philosopher or a continental philosopher. Right? I'm proud to be an analytic or a continental philosopher. I freely choose to be an analytic continental philosopher. Um, is the latter plausible when you spent most of your life at MIT or at Freiburg? Or, you know, Heidegger or so? Mm. Uh, is that really a free choice? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And now philosophy narrow. I'm a pragmatist philosopher. I'm proud to be a pragmatist philosopher. I freely choose to be a pragmatist philosopher. No comments at this point. All right, here's an interlude, a short interlude. My, symp my sympathy for all these monisms, including the metaphilosophical positions, is very limited. Very limited. This is not an argument. I'm just telling you to know how I feel about that. Sometimes I mean, in philosophy, we don't talk about our feelings much, right? And I think we should be more open there. Open. Okay. Speak about our feelings this well. Okay. I've seen it too often that the cost of joining any philosophical school that is to become a metaphysical monist is the loss of at least 10 philosophical IQ points. I've really seen that. I've been at many institutes, you know, I've got a long career of moderate uh, success. But I've seen that, I mean, you know, these German constructivists, I mean, oh God, and, and others as well. I mean, this is the English school, and, you know, I've, been, I've seen a lot here. So um, other people may have more uh, philosophical IQ points. I can't afford losing 10 philosophical IQ points. My, my work would be even <laughs> I don't know. Does one size really fit all? You know, one size practice or analytic philosophy or continental? Well, this is still not an argument, right? You're aware of it. You're just, you know, on a very personal level now exchanging our feelings. Uh, how we, well, exchanging is an exaggeration. I'm the only one who talks. Okay, that's the interlude. Now let's continue with monism. Obviously, Hassett defends pragmatism in his book. He's not just considering or analyzing it. Please see the difference to my book on Kuhn, because many people say, Heuningen is a Kuhnian. Nonsense. I am an analyst of Kuhn's philosophy. I'm not defending it. So uh, I'm, I'm just trying to you know, don't misread it in this miserable way. Anyway, so Hazard defends pragmatism. In other words, on the metaphilosophical level, Hazard defends monism, although he rejects all kinds of monism on the object level. And that's very interesting. And polemically among friends, Hazard tries to force everything into a pragmatist straitjacket, including logic. I see that. I think that's a straitjacket, you know. Now, here comes the obvious question. 
Why is Hasog not a pluralist also on the meta level? Why does it get into this pragmatist straight jacket and tries to analyze everything in terms of pragmatism? I mean, of liberal pragmatism, whatever. But still, why does he do that? I don't know, right? And, and now I speak about metaphysical pluralism. And I think isn't pluralism attractive also on the metaphilosophical level, not only on the object level, where Hassock practices it wonderfully, you know, with complete intellectual openness and looking, you know, there's so many interesting things and we can analyze them. Admitting more than one kind of philosophical approach, exploiting the richness of the philosophical tradition. Wouldn't that be the, a wonderful motive to do that? And here are some abstract statements and arguments for metaphilosophical pluralism, and they are generated by a variation of Hassock's argument for pluralism on the object level. And I'm just modifying that. Here we go. So, that's Hassock. Realism is generally taken as a monist position, both in metaphysics and in the philosophy of science, but in my view, monism must be rejected if it stands in the way of progress. Now, here comes the modification. Pragmatism is generally taken as a monist position, both in metaphysics and philosophy of science, but in my view, monism must be rejected if it stands in the way of progress. Yes, if pragmatism is sometimes a straitjacket, away with it. All right, or here. True realism will pursue knowledge, freed up uh, from the unnecessary constraints of monism. All theories and all systems of practice that facilitate successful activities provide ways of learning, and they should all be maintained and developed actively. My statement? True metaphilosophy will pursue knowledge freed up from all unnecessary constraints of monism. All philosophical theories and systems of practice that facilitate successful philosophical thought provide uh, ways of learning, and they should be maintained and developed actively. So, on the matter, oh, in science, all modes of inquiry should be put uh, to work in this relentless drive to increase and improve knowledge. In philosophy, all modes of inquiry, not only pragmatist ones, should be put to work in this relentless drive to increase and improve knowledge. Oh, well, I, I, uh, well, philosophically, here's the, uh, the iteration, and iterative progress can also result in the improvement of methods and principles of inquiry. This applies to all manner of rules that are used in science. Yes, iterative progress can also result in the improvement of methods and principles of philosophy, philosophical inquiry. This applies to all manners of rules that are used in philosophy. So, and here's, I think, the last one. I also think that an explicit adoption of pluralism can enrich and ease the pragmatist view on um, truth. First, adopting pluralism concerning the concept of truth liberates the pragmatist theory of truth from having to account for all uses of truth by means of one idea. So this is really general and, and, and serious um, uh, uh, pluralism. And I say, uh, I also think that an explicit adoption of pluralism can enrich and ease philosophy. First, adopting metaphilosophical pluralism liberates philosoph philosophy <coughs> from having to account for all philosophical issues by means of one idea. And now, uh, uh, in order to, to say that I really mean that, uh, I've got to speak about my own work uh, for a short while. And as an illustration, I did not do that consciously, but looking back now, I see when I look and reflect on my own work, I've always been an absolutely opportunist pluralist regarding philosophical means apart from my very beginning when I was successfully brainwashed by Stegman. Then I was a monist belief, Stegman, that's the truth of philosophy, that's how it goes, you know, logical, wow, Stegman, wonderful. I did all the others, you know. Okay, so I give you an example of my work on concept, and uh, I've worked for some time in philosophy, and I give you the example when I worked on concepts, what I did. In my career, I have both used very traditional continental and modern analytic means when it came to the analysis of concepts. Uh, it would not cross my mind to press everything into one pro-Christian metaphysic, metaphilosophical bag. I am a complete opportunist. You know, I say, I don't care what the schools are, what can I use? So, give you an example. So, for instance, very old since Aristotle, even Plato, disambiguation. So, if you look at the, the concept of world in Kuhn, you've got to disambiguate it, right? And you find that it can't already, of course. Then, disentanglement or deconstruction of concept mergers. What I tried to tell you about the correspondence theory of truth would be an example. And I also did it with the context of discovery and justification, where I said, you know, these are five distinct <laughs> merged into one. If you want to get philosophical clarity, disentangle that or deconstruct it. So then the distinction between kinds of definitions, which is also in continental philosophy, of course, well known from Leibniz and Kant on at least, 
different kinds of uh, definitions, for instance, analytic or real definition and synthetic or stipulative or nominal definition, for instance, in logic. In my logic book, I mean, this is a constitutive element, you've got to distinguish, uh, distinguish between these definitions. Then, the distinction between a definition of and criteria for a concept, which is also already in Kant, and that's very useful, concept of truth, objectivity is a paper that's coming out soon, hopefully if it's not rejected again. Um, then, close reading, hermeneutics, techniques, which, and historical tracing. So, for instance, when I tried to analyze incommensurability, I really had to understand what do these crazy guys mean, Feyerabend, and, you know, what is it, what they mean? Close reading, hermeneutic, you know, context, blah, blah, blah. Nothing of the other techniques works. Then, genealogy. I mean, I wrote a paper then on the genealogy of Kuhn's sort of anti-realism in order to understand what's going on there, what's, what's really the history of the whole thing over 500 years, starting with Copernicus. Very useful to understand what's going on there. Then, Canapian explanation is the one that I, in a sense, like best, right? Although I'm not an analytic philosopher. For instance, in my book on logic, Logical Consequence, I've never found in any book a Canapian explanation of logical consequence. If you do that, you understand what's going on, what's going wrong in classical logic and what's going on in logic and what the problems are there. Then, also something which I hadn't planned to do, reflective equilibrium. So in my, con in my analysis then of logical consequence, it turned out I need the concept of uh, reflective equilibrium between examples and rules and blah, 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 in order to make clear what this uh, concept of logical consequence really means. So it's again completely heterogeneous and it, it, I just stumbled upon it. Then, something new, multi-level semantics coupled with Wittgensteinian family resemblance. Uh, someone else has uh, termed that, what I do in my book, book on systematicity, namely if you analyze uh, concepts like refinement or systematicity, you've got to first distinguish different levels of abstraction, and then you can use at a lower level of abstraction, you can use Wittgensteinian family resemblance. Wonderful, it doesn't go with Carnap, yeah, well, I don't want to marry them, I want to use that for some concept. And finally, of course, invention of new concepts, for instance, uh, genetically subject sided contributions, or which you haven't seen so far, orientation of the paradigms. If the paper is accepted uh, after resubmission, you will find out what I say about orientation of the paradigms together with the co author. Anyway, so what is my conclusion? The correspondence theory of truth, as conceived of in analytic philosophy, is useless in philosophy of science. Period. The remedy is the disentanglement of the correspondence idea from metaphysical realism. The semantic move to a pragmatist theory of truth is unnecessary, I think, because that concept works, and unconvincing. And finally, pragmatism is a metaphilosophical monism that should be given up in favor of metaphilosophical pluralism. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I had sent the slides of my talk to Hasok Chang earlier. After my talk, he had the chance to reply. And he focused on two main points, which I represent here in very condensed form. So the first point was that Hasok denies that he is a metaphysical monist. This is what I had claimed. He says, He's also a metaphysical pluralist. And the reason that this doesn't become so open is that his book is only about pragmatism because pragmatism has yet been underdeveloped in the philosophy of science, and therefore he did develop it in his book. The pluralism, metaphilosophical pluralism that he defends does not imply the renunciation of judgment on philosophical positions, which would be an extreme form of relativism who would uh, try to do that. Instead, a pluralist uh, of uh, Chang's type can defend and advocate certain specific positions, while allowing that other positions should also be given the chance to be defended. And this implies that there may be productive outcomes arising from interaction because between different positions. So in a word, Hasok Chang claims that he's also a metaphilosophical 
pluralist. The second main point was that Hassock denies that correspondence can deliver a definition of primary empirical truth. This is where he claims, in accordance with his pluralism about truth, that correspondence may be useful as a secondary truth, or in other words, correspondence needs grounding in primary pragmatic truth. So these were his main comments. He had others, but this is just a short summary.